This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. The Spirit of Revolt by Peter Kropotkin Section 1 In the lives of societies, there are times when revolution becomes a pressing necessity, when it is imposed in an absolute way. New ideas germany everywhere. They seek to emerge, to find an application in life, but they continually clash with the forces of inertia of those who have an interest in maintaining the old system. They stifle in the suffocating atmosphere of old prejudices and traditions. The accepted notions on the constitution of states, on the laws of social equilibrium, on the political and economic relations between citizens, no longer hold before the severe criticism which undermines them every day, on every occasion, in the living room as in the pub, in the works of the philosopher as in daily conversation. Political, economic and social institutions fall into ruin. A building which has become uninhabitable, it hinders, it prevents the development of the seeds that are growing in the cracks of its walls and are emerging all around it. A need for new life is being felt. The established code of morality which governs most men in their daily lives no longer seems sufficient. We become aware that something previously considered fair is just a crying injustice. The morality of yesterday is today recognised as being a disgusting immorality. The conflict between new ideas and old traditions breaks out in all classes of society, in all circles, even in the heart of the family. The son struggles with his father. He finds disgusting what his father found natural throughout his life. The daughter rebels against the principles which her mother has handed down to her as the fruit of long experience. The popular consciousness rises up against the scandals that are produced within the privileged and idle class, against the crimes committed in the name of the right of the strongest or to maintain privileges. Those who want the triumph of justice Those who want to put new ideas into practice are soon forced to recognise that the realisation of their generous humanitarian and regenerative ideas cannot take place in society as it is constituted. They understand the necessity for a revolutionary upheaval which will sweep away all this rottenness, invigorate with its breath the numbed hearts and bring to humanity the devotion, the self-sacrifice, the heroism without which a society becomes debased degraded and decays. During periods of frantic racing towards enrichment, of feverish speculations and crises, of the sudden ruin of great industries and the ephemeral flourishing of other branches of production, of scandalous fortunes amassed in a few years and squandered as quickly, we understand that the economic institutions presiding over production and exchange are far from giving society the well-being they are supposed to guarantee it, they lead precisely to the opposite outcome. Instead of order, they breed chaos. In place of well-being, misery, insecurity for the future. Instead of harmony of interests, war, a perpetual war of the exploiter against the producer and of these amongst themselves. We see society split more and more into two hostile camps and at the same time subdividing into thousands of small groups waging bitter war. Weary of these wars, weary of the miseries they cause, society begins to search for a new organisation. It cries loudly for a complete restructuring of the system of property, of production, of exchange, and all the economic relations that flow from them. The governmental machine, charged with maintaining the existing order, still functions. But at each turn of its worn-out wheels, it slips and stops. Its functioning becomes more and more difficult and the discontent produced by its failures is always growing. Every day, new demands arise. Reform this, reform that, they cry from all sides. War, finance, taxes, courts, police, everything must be remodelled, reorganised, established on new foundations, say the reformers. And yet all understand that it is impossible to remake, to remodel anything. Since everything is interdependent, everything would have to be remade at once. 
and how to remake when society is divided into two openly hostile camps. Satisfying the discontented would merely create new ones. Unable of embarking on the path of reform, since that would be to engage in revolution, at the same time too impotent to throw themselves frankly into reaction, governments apply themselves to half measures, which satisfy no one and merely arouse new discontent. The mediocrities charged to steer the ship of state during these transitory periods dream only of one thing, to enrich themselves in anticipation of the upcoming disaster. Attacked from all sides, they defend themselves clumsily, they waver, they commit folly upon folly, and they succeed in soon cutting the last cord of salvation. They drown the prestige of the government in the ridicule of their incompetence. In these periods, revolution imposes itself. It becomes a social necessity. The situation is a revolutionary situation. When we read in the works of our best historians the genesis and the development of the great revolutionary upheavals, we usually find under the title of The Causes of the Revolution a striking picture of the situation on the eve of events. The misery of the people, the general insecurity, the vexatious measures of the government, the odious scandals that expose the great vices of society, the new ideas seeking to emerge and clashing against the incapacity of the henchmen of the old system. Nothing is lacking. In contemplating this picture, we reach the conviction that the revolution was in fact inevitable, that there was no other way out than the path of insurrectionary acts. Let us take for an example the situation before 1789, such as the historians show it to us. You seem to hear the peasant complain about the salt tax, the tithes, the feudal fees, and vow in his heart an implacable hatred for the landlord, the monk, the monopolist, the bailiff. You seem to see the bourgeois complain about having lost their municipal liberties and heap abuse on the king with their curses. You hear the people blame the queen, outraged at what they hear the ministers are doing and say to each other all the time that taxes are intolerable and the fees exorbitant, the harvests are poor and the winter too harsh, the food is too expensive and the monopolists too greedy, that the village lawyers devour the peasants' harvest and that the village constable wants to play the little king, that even the postal service is badly organised and the officials are lazy. In short, nothing works. Everyone complains. This cannot continue. It will end badly, they say on all sides. But there is a wide abyss from these arguments to insurrection, to revolt. The one which in the majority of humanity separates argument from act, thought, from will, from need to action. How then was this abyss crossed? How did these men who only yesterday quietly grumbled about their fate as they puffed their pipes and who, a moment later, humbly greet the same village constable and gendarme they had just spoken ill of, how could these same men, a few days later, seize their scythes and pikes and attack in his chateau the lord who just yesterday was so terrible? By what magic did these men, whom their wives rightly treated as cowards, today transform themselves into heroes who march against bullets and shells to conquer their rights? How did these words, so often spoken in the past and lost in the air like the hollow sound of bells, at last become transformed into acts? The answer is simple. It is action the continuous action endlessly renewed of minorities that achieves this transformation. Courage, devotion, the spirit of sacrifice are as contagious as cowardice, submission and panic. What forms will the agitation take? All the most varied forms which will be dictated to it by circumstances, means, temperaments. Sometimes grim, sometimes mocking but always daring, sometimes collective, sometimes purely individual. It neglects none of the means at hand, no circumstance of public life, to always keep the spirit roused, to propagate and express discontent, to excite hatred against the exploiters, to ridicule rulers, to show their weaknesses, and above all, and always, to awaken audacity, the spirit of revolt, by leading, 
by example. Section 2. When a revolutionary situation occurs in a country before the spirit of revolt is sufficiently awakened in the masses to lead to tumultuous demonstrations in the street or by revolts and uprisings, it is by action that minorities manage to awaken this feeling of independence and this spirit of audacity without which no revolution can be accomplished. Men of courage who are not content with words but who seek to carry them out Honest characters for whom the act is one with the idea, for whom prison, exile and death are preferable to a life at odds with their principles. Intrepid men who know that it is necessary to dare in order to succeed. These are the lonely sentinels who enter into battle long before the masses are sufficiently aroused to openly raise the flag of insurrection and march arms in hand to the conquest of their rights. In the midst of the complaints, the chatter, the theoretical discussions, an act of revolt, individual or collective, occurs that symbolises the prevailing aspirations. It may be that at first the mass is indifferent. While admiring the courage of the individual or the group that takes the initiative, it may well at first follow the wise and prudent who are eager to confirm, who are eager to condemn this act of folly and say that the fools, the hotheads, will jeopardise everything. The wise and the prudent had so carefully calculated that their party, slowly pursuing its work, will succeed in a hundred, in two hundred, three hundred years, perhaps, in conquering the whole world. And now the unexpected intervenes. The unexpected, of course, is what was not foreseen by them, the wise and the prudent. Whoever knows a bit of history and possesses a brain that is somewhat orderly, knows perfectly well beforehand that a theoretical propaganda for the revolution necessarily is translated into acts long before the theoreticians have decided that the moment for action has come. Nevertheless, the wise theoreticians will get angry with the madmen, excommunicate them, condemn them to anathema. But the madmen find sympathy. The mass of the people secretly applauds their audacity and they will find imitators. As the first of them go to fill the prisons and penal colonies, others appear to continue their work. Acts of illegal protest, of revolt, of revenge, multiply. Indifference is henceforth impossible. Those who at first did not even ask themselves what the madmen wanted are forced to consider them, to discuss their ideas, to take sides for or against. By the actions which impose themselves onto the general attention, the new idea seeps into minds and gains converts. Such an act makes more propaganda in a few days than thousands of pamphlets. Above all, it awakens the spirit of revolt. It breeds audacity. The old system, armed with police, magistrates, gendarmes and soldiers seemed unshakable, like that old fortress, the Bastille, which too seemed impenetrable in the eyes of the unarmed people gathered beneath its high walls, topped with loaded cannons. But it soon becomes clear that the established regime does not have the strength that had been supposed. This audacious act was enough to disrupt the governmental machine for a few days, to shake the colossus. That disturbance has turned an entire province upside down and the army, ever so imposing, retreated before a handful of peasants armed with stones and sticks. The people realise that the monster is not so terrible as was believed. They start to see that a few energetic efforts will be enough to bring it down. Hope is born in hearts. And let us remember that if exasperation often leads to riots, It is always hope, the hope of victory, that makes revolutions. The government resists. It cracks down with fury. But if formerly repression killed the energy of the oppressed, now, in times of turmoil, it produces the opposite effect. It provokes new acts of rebellion, individual and collective. It pushes the rebels to heroism and gradually these actions reach 
new social strata, become generalised, grow. The Revolutionary Party is reinforced by elements which had hitherto been hostile to it or had wallowed in indifference. The disintegration spreads to the government, the ruling classes, the privileged. Some push for all-out resistance, others are in favour of concessions, still others go so far as to declare themselves ready to renounce, for now, their privileges, so as to appease the spirit of revolt, leaving it to be mastered later. The unity of the government and the privileged is broken. The ruling classes may still try to resort to a furious reaction, but this is no longer the moment. The struggle only becomes more acute, and the forthcoming revolution will only be bloodier. Furthermore, the smallest concession on the part of the ruling classes, since it comes too late, since it is exacted by struggle, merely further awakens the revolutionary spirit. The people, which previously might have been content with this concession, realise that the enemy is faltering. It anticipates victory. It feels its courage grow. And these same men who once, crushed by poverty, were content to sigh in secret, now raise their heads and march proudly to the conquest of a better future. Finally, the revolution breaks out, all the more violent as the preceding struggle had been bitter. The direction which the revolution takes will, of course, depend on the sum total of the various circumstances that have determined the arrival of the cataclysm. But it can be foreseen in advance, according to the strength of the revolutionary action deployed in the preparatory period by the various advanced parties. Such a party may have better elaborated the theories it advocates and the programmes it seeks to realise and will have propagated it far by word and pen, but it has not sufficiently affirmed its aspirations in the open, in the streets, by actions that are the realisation of its own thought. It has done little, or else it has not acted against those who are its principal enemies. It has not struck the institutions it aims to demolish. It had theoretical power, but it did not have the power of action. It has done little to awaken the spirit of revolt or neglected to direct it against that which it, above all, seeks to attack during the revolution. Well, this party is less well known. Its claims have not been affirmed continually every day by acts whose impact reaches the most isolated hut, have not sufficiently penetrated into the mass of the people. They have not passed through the crucible of the crowd and the street and have not found that their simple statement, which is summed up in a single word, has become popular. The most zealous writers of the party are known to their readers as thinkers of merit, but they have neither the reputation nor the capacities of the man of action, and on the day when the crowd goes down into the street, it will rather follow the advice of those who perhaps have less clear theoretical ideas and narrower aspirations, but which it knows better because... It has seen them act. The party which has done the most revolutionary agitation, which has demonstrated the most life and daring, this party will be the most heeded on the day when action becomes necessary, when it will be necessary to march from the front to accomplish the revolution. Those who had not the audacity to assert themselves by revolutionary actions in the preparatory period those who have not had a powerful enough impetus to inspire individuals and groups with feelings of self-sacrifice, the irresistible desire to put their ideas into practice, if that idea had existed, it would have been translated into action long before the whole people had come into the streets. Those who have not been able to make their flag popular and their aspirations palpable and comprehensible, that party will have only a meagre chance of realising even the smallest part of its programme it will be overwhelmed by parties of action. This is what the history of the periods preceding great revolutions teach us. The revolutionary bourgeoisie clearly understood this. It neglected no means of agitation to awaken the spirit of revolt when they strove to demolish the monarchical regime. The French peasant of the last century also understood it instinctively when he agitated for the abolition of feudal rights and the international acted in accordance with the same principles when it sought to awaken the spirit of revolt among the urban workers and to direct it against the natural enemy of the wage worker, the monopolist of the instruments of labour 
and of raw materials. Section 3 A study ought to be made, extremely interesting, engaging and above all informative, of the various means of agitation to which revolutionaries have had recourse to at various periods to accelerate the outbreak of the revolution, to make the masses aware of the events that were brewing, to better show the people its principal enemies, to awaken audacity and the spirit of revolt. We know very well why such a revolution has become necessary, but it is only instinctively and tentatively that we manage to guess how revolutions were born. The Prussian general staff has recently published a manual for use by the army on the art of overcoming popular insurrections and teaches in this work how to disrupt a revolt, how to demoralise, how to scatter its forces. Today they want to strike sure blows to slaughter the people according to all the regulations. Well, the study of which we speak would be an answer to that publication and to so many others that deal, sometimes with less cynicism, with the same subject. It would show how a government is disorganised, how its forces are scattered, how we raise the morale of a faltering people, depressed by the poverty and the oppression it has suffered. So far, no such study has been made. Historians have eloquently told us of the main stages through which humanity has marched towards its liberation, but they have paid little attention to the periods preceding revolutions. Absorbed by the dramas they try to sketch, they skate over with a quick hand the prologue. But it is this prologue that, above all, interests us. Yet what picture is more gripping, more sublime and more beautiful than that of the efforts made by the precursors of revolutions? What a relentless series of efforts on the part of the peasants and men of action from the bourgeoisie before 1789. What a tenacious struggle on the part of the republicans from the restoration of the Bourbons in 1815 to their fall in 1830. What activity on the part of the secret societies during the reign of the grand bourgeois Louis-Philippe. What a poignant picture is that of the conspiracies conducted by the Italians to shake off the Austrian yoke, their heroic attempts, the unspeakable sufferings of their martyrs. What a sad and impressive tragedy is that which would recount all the vicissitudes of the secret activity undertaken by the youth of Russia against the government and the land-owning and capitalist regime from 1860 to the present day. What noble figures would emerge before the modern socialists when reading these dramas? What dedication and sublime self-sacrifice and, at the same time, what a revolutionary education, not theoretical but practical, which the current generation should build upon for its own benefit. This is not the place to undertake such a study. We must therefore limit ourselves to choosing some examples in order to show how our forefathers made revolutionary agitation and what kind of conclusions can be drawn from the studies in question. We shall take a look at one of these periods as the one preceding 1789 and, leaving aside the analysis of the circumstances which had created a revolutionary situation towards the end of the last century, we shall confine ourselves to highlighting a few of the methods of agitation used by our predecessors. Two major events emerge as a result of the revolution of 1789 to 1793. On the one hand, the abolition of the royal autocracy and the advent of the bourgeoisie to power. On the other, the definitive abolition of serfdom and of feudal fees in the countryside. The two are intimately linked together. One could not have succeeded without the other. And these two currents can already be found in the agitation that preceded the revolution. The agitation against royalty amongst the bourgeoisie. Agitation against the rights of the landlords amongst the peasants. Let us take a look at both. The newspaper did not at that time have the importance it enjoys today. It was the leaflet, the pamphlet, the sheet of three or four pages which took its place. Accordingly, the leaflet, the pamphlet, abounded. The pamphlet put the ideas of the harbingers of the revolution, the philosophers and the economists, within the reach of the great mass. 
the pamphlet and the leaflet produced unrest by attacking three principal enemies, the king and his court, the aristocracy, the clergy. They did not theorise. They proceeded by means of derision. Thousands of leaflets recounted the vices of the court and especially of the queen, ridiculing this court, stripping it of its deceptive adornments, exposing it in all its vices, its squandering, its perversity, its stupidity. The royal love affairs, the scandals of the court, the wild spending, the famine pact, that alliance of the powerful with the monopolists of wheat to enrich themselves by starving the people, that was the subject of these pamphlets. The pamphleteers were always on the attack and never neglected any event in public life to strike the enemy. Provided that some event was publicly spoken about, the pamphlet and the leaflet were there to deal with it without embarrassment in their own way. They lent themselves better than the newspaper to this kind of agitation. The newspaper is quite an undertaking and it must be looked at closely before it is launched. Its collapse usually embarrasses an entire party. The pamphlet and the leaflet compromise only the writer and the printer. Go and find one or the other. It is obvious that the authors of these writings begin, above all, to free themselves from censorship. For they had not yet invented this pretty little instrument of contemporary Jesuitism, the press trial, which annihilates all freedom of the revolutionary writer. They had la lettre de cachet to imprison the authors and the printers. A brutal method, it is true, but at least honest. This is why authors printed their pamphlets either in Amsterdam or anywhere. A hundred leagues from the Bastille under the tree of liberty. So they did not hesitate in striking hard and vilifying the king, the queen and her lovers, the grandees of the court, the aristos. With the press clandestine, the police had to search the bookshops, arrest the sellers. The unknown authors escaped prosecution and continued their work. The song, that which is too strong to be printed, but which made its way around France by being memorised, has always been one of the most effective means of propaganda. It fell on the established authorities. It ridiculed crowned heads. It sowed in the family home contempt for royalty, hatred for the clergy and the aristocracy, hope of soon seeing the day of the revolution arrive. But it was, above all, to the poster that the agitators resorted. The poster was talked about more. It agitated more than a leaflet or a pamphlet. Thus posters, printed or written by hand, appeared every time something happened that concerned the mass of the public. Torn down today, they reappeared tomorrow, enraging the government and its henchmen. We failed to get your grandfather. We will not fail with you, the king reads today on a sheet stuck to his palace walls. Tomorrow it is the queen who weeps with rage while reading how the details of her shameful life are displayed upon the walls. This was the start of the hatred towards the woman who would have coldly exterminated Paris to remain queen and autocrat. The courtiers proposed to celebrate the birthday of the Dauphin. Posters threatened to set fire to the four corners of the city and so they sow panic in the court, preparing minds for something extraordinary. Or else they announced that on the day of the festivities, the king and queen will be taken under heavy guard to the Place de Grève and then to the town hall to confess their crimes and mount a scaffold to be there burnt alive. The king convenes the assembly of notables. Immediately posters announce that the new troupe of comedians organised by Monsieur de Calon, the Prime Minister, will commence its performances on the 29th of this month and give an allegorical dance entitled Danades Barrel. Or, becoming ever more malicious, the posters get into the dressing room of the Queen, announcing to her that tyrants would soon be executed. But it was above all against the monopolists of wheat, against the tax farmers, against the bailiffs that posters were used. Each time there was turmoil among the people, posters announced a St Bartholomew's Day for bailiffs and tax farmers. Such and such a wheat merchant, such and such a manufacturer, such and such a bailiff are detested by the people. Posters condemn them to death. In the name of the council of the people, in the name of the people's parliament, etc. And later on, when the opportunity arose for starting an uprising, it was against these exploiters, whose names had so often been mentioned on posters, 
that popular fury was brought to bear. If only we could gather together all the countless posters that were displayed over the 10, 15 years preceding the revolution, we would understand what an immense role this kind of agitation played in preparing for the revolutionary upheaval. Jovial and mocking to begin with, more and more menacing as we approach the end, it is always alert, always ready to respond to every current political event and to the mindset of the masses. It aroused anger, contempt. It named the true enemies of the people. It awoke within the peasants, the workers and the bourgeoisie hatred against their enemies. It announced the approach of the day of liberation and vengeance. Hanging or quartering in effigy was a very widespread custom in the past century. It was also one of the most popular means of agitation. Every time there were popular stirrings, crowds gathered which carried a doll representing the enemy of the moment, which they hung, burnt or quartered. Childishness, said the young old men who think themselves so reasonable. Well, the storming of Revillon's home during the elections of 1789, the election of Fouon and of Berthier, which completely changed the character of the looming revolution, were these not the accomplishments, in reality, of what had been prepared for long ago, by the execution of straw dolls? Here are a few examples out of a thousand. The people of Paris did not like Maupieux, one of the ministers dear to Louis XIV. Well, one day they gathered. Voices from the crowd shouted, Judgment of Parliament condemning Monsieur Maupieux, Chancellor of France, to be burnt alive and his ashes scattered to the wind. After which the crowd actually marched to the statue of Henry IV, with a doll of the Chancellor, covered in all his insignia, and the doll was burnt to the cheers of the crowd. Another day, they hang a doll of Abbot Terray in ecclesiastical garb and white gloves from a lamppost. In Rouen, they quarter the same Mapieux in effigy, and when the gendarmes prevent a crowd from forming, they confine themselves with hanging by the feet an effigy of a monopolist, with wheat leaking from its nose, mouth and ears. A whole propaganda in that puppet, and a propaganda far more effective in making itself heard than abstract propaganda, which speaks only to the small number of the converted. The essential thing to prepare the unrest that preceded the Great Revolution was that the people should get used to going down into the street to show their opinions in the public square, that they get used to defying the police, the troops, the cavalry. This is why the revolutionaries of the time did not neglect any of the means of drawing the mob into the streets to incite the crowds. Each event of public life in Paris and in the provinces was used in this manner. If public opinion had obtained from the king the dismissal of a detested minister, there was rejoicing, endless enlightenment. To attract everybody, firecrackers were burnt, rockets were thrown, Quote, in such quantity that in some places they had to walk on the cardboard, end quote. And if money was lacking to buy some, they stopped well-dressed passers-by and asked them, quote, politely but firmly, say contemporaries, for a few pennies to entertain the people, end quote. Then, when the crowd was dense, speakers would address them to explain and comment on events, and the clubs would organise openly. And if the cavalry or infantry arrived to disperse the crowd, they would hesitate to use violence against peaceful men and women, while the fireworks that exploded before the horses and the foot soldiers, to the cheers and laughter of the public, arrested the passion of those who advanced too far into the midst of the people. In the provincial towns, it is sometimes chimney sweeps who go into the streets, parodying King's Bed of Justice, all burst into laughter on seeing the man with the dirty face parodying the king or his wife. Acrobats, jugglers attracting thousands of spectators in the square, would let fly, in the midst of their funny stories, their barbs directed at the powerful and the rich. A crowd forms, their remarks become more and more threatening, and then beware the powerful whose carriage appears on the scene. He will certainly be manhandled by the crowd. The mind works only in this way. What opportunities will intelligent men not find in gathering crowds, formed initially of laughter, then of men ready to act in a moment of turmoil, especially if the turmoil has been prepared in advance by the situation and by the deeds 
of men of action. All of this being given, on the one hand, a revolutionary situation, general discontent, and on the other, the posters, the pamphlets, the songs, the executions in effigy, all this emboldened the population and soon their gatherings became more and more threatening. Today, it is the Archbishop of Paris who is assaulted at a crossroads. Tomorrow, it is a duke or a count who narrowly escapes being thrown into the water. Another day, the crowd amuses itself by jeering at the members of the government as they pass by, etc. The acts of revolt vary endlessly, in anticipation of the day when a spark will be sufficient for a crowd to turn into a riot, and the riot into a revolution. It is the dregs of the people, it is the scoundrels, the shiftless who rioted, our pompous historians tell us today. Well, yes, indeed, it was not among the well-to-do people that the bourgeois revolutionaries sought allies. As the latter merely complained in sitting rooms to grovel a moment later, well, indeed, it was in the disreputable taverns of the slums that they went in search of comrades armed with cudgels when it came to jeering your grace the Archbishop of Paris, notwithstanding the experts who deny these facts today. Section 4 If action had been limited to attacking the men and institutions of government without touching the economic institutions, would the Great Revolution ever have been what it was in reality? That is to say, a general uprising of the popular masses, peasants and workers, against the privileged classes? Would the revolution have lasted four years? Would it have shaken France to its core? Would it have found that invincible spirit which gave it the strength to resist the, quote, conspiring kings? Certainly not. Let historians sing as much as they wish the glories of the, quote, gentlemen of the third estate, of the constituent assembly, of the convention. We know what happened. We know that the revolution would only have resulted in a microscopic, constitutional limitation of royal power without touching the feudal system if peasant France had not risen up and had not maintained for four years anarchy, the spontaneous revolutionary action of groups and individuals freed from all governmental tutelage. We know that the peasant would not have remained the beast of burden of the landlord if the Jacquerie had not raged from 1788 to 1793 until the time when the convention was forced to consecrate by a law what the peasants had already accomplished, the abolition without compensation of all the feudal fees and the restitution to the communes of the property that had previously been stolen from them by the rich under the old regime. In vain would they have expected justice from the assemblies to be anything other than a deception if the barefooted peasants and the sans-culottes had not thrown into the parliamentary balance the weight of their cudgels and their pikes. But it was not by agitation directed against the ministers, nor by plastering Paris in posters directed against the Queen, that the uprising of the small villages could be prepared. This uprising, the result of the general situation of the country, was also prepared by the agitation made among the people, by men who came from it and who attacked these immediate enemies, the lord, the landholding priest, the monopolizers of wheat, the big bourgeois. This kind of agitation is less well known than the preceding one. The history of Paris is complete. That of the village has never been seriously begun. History ignores the peasant. And yet the little we do know about it is already enough to give us a sense. The pamphlet, the leaflet, did not penetrate into the village. The peasant at that time could hardly read. Well, it was by the printed image, often daubed by hand, simple and comprehensible, that propaganda was being made. A few words scribbled alongside roughly drawn pictures spread in the villages, and a whole story was crafted in the popular imagination concerning the king, the queen, the Count d'Artois, Madame de Lambire, the famine pact, the lords, quote, vampires sucking the blood of the people, it went around the villages and prepared minds. There was a handmade poster attached to a tree, arousing revolt, promising the approach of better times and telling of the disturbances that had broken out in other provinces at the other end of France. Under the name of the Jacques, secret groups were formed in villages, 
either to set fire to the Lord's barn or to destroy his crops or his game or to execute him. And how many times did they find a corpse in the chateau stabbed by a knife which bore this inscription? On behalf of the Jacques. A heavy coach would descend the side of a ravine, taking the Lord to his domain. But two passers-by, helped by the coachman, strangle him and roll his body to the bottom of the ravine. And in his pocket was found a paper saying, on behalf of the Jacques, and so on. Or else one day at a crossroads they would see a gallows bearing this inscription, If the Lord dares to collect his fees, he will be hanged on this gibbet. Whoever dares to pay them to the Lord will meet the same fate. And the peasant paid no more without being forced to do so by the constabulary, happy deep down to have found a pretext for not paying. He felt that there was a hidden force that supported him. He was getting used to the idea of not paying, of rebelling against the Lord. And soon, in fact, he was no longer paying anything. And by that threat, he wrested from the Lord the renunciation of all fees. There were posters continuously in the village announcing that henceforward there would be no longer any fees to pay, that the chateau and the terrier registers of fees, must be burnt that the council of the people had just issued a decree to that effect, etc., etc. Bread! No more fees or taxes! This was the slogan that was used in the countryside, a slogan that was comprehensible to all, going right to the heart of the mother whose children had not eaten for three days, going right to the mind of the peasant harassed by the constabulary who was extracting his unpaid taxes. Down with the monopolist! and his stores were forced open, his wheat convoys held up, and disturbances raged across the provinces. Down with the toll gates, and the barricades were burnt, the officials overwhelmed, and the towns, lacking money, rebelled in their turn against the central power which demanded it of them. Set fire to the tax registers, the account books, the municipal archives. And as the paperwork burned in July 1789, power was disorganised. The lords emigrated, and the revolution extended ever more its circle of fire. Everything that was played out on the great stage of Paris was merely a reflection of what was happening in the provinces during the revolution, which, for four years, roared in every town, every hamlet, and in which the people concerned itself much less with its enemies in the central power than with its closest enemies, the local exploiters and bloodsuckers. Let us summarise. The revolution of 1788 to 1793, which offers us on a grand scale the disorganisation of the state by popular revolution, eminently economic, like every really popular revolution, thus provides us with valuable lessons. Long before 1789, France already presented a revolutionary situation. But The spirit of revolt had not yet sufficiently matured for the revolution to break out. It was, therefore, on the development of this spirit of insubordination, of audacity, of hatred against the social order that the revolutionaries directed their efforts. While the revolutionaries from the bourgeoisie directed their attacks against the government, the popular revolutionaries, the men of the people, whose names history has not even preserved. The men of the people prepared their uprising, their revolution, by acts of revolt directed against the lords, tax officials and exploiters of every kind. In 1788, when the approach of the revolution was announced by serious disturbances by the mass of the people, royalty and the bourgeoisie sought to control it by a few concessions. But how could they appease the popular wave by the Estates General, by the Jesuitical concessions of the 4th of August 1789, or by the miserable acts of the legislature? They might thus appease a political uprising, but with so very little they cannot get the better of a popular revolt. And the wave still rose. But while attacking property, at the same time it disorganised the state it rendered every government absolutely impossible and the revolt of the people directed against the lords and the rich in general ended, as we all know, after four years 
by sweeping away royalty and absolutism. This advance is how all great revolutions advance. It will be how the next revolution will develop and advance, if it is to be, as we are convinced, not a mere change of government, but a true popular revolution, a cataclysm which will transform from top to bottom the system of property. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.